Hey everybody. So I think it's pretty obvious to all of us that we're super sick as a country. Half the population is on a chronic medication. Did you know pre-1960, 0% of the population was on chronic medication. There was no such thing as chronic medication. Now you might think, well, it's great. Modern medicine, it's these discoveries and medications have saved our lives. Well, actually the exact opposite. Medications are the number three leading cause of death in America. That's medications taken appropriately, taken out the opioid overdoses. Medical errors are fourth leading cause of death. So altogether, it's the number one leading cause of death. Overall, our health has deteriorated from 1960 to current. We are sicker now than we've ever been. And let me read a few stats just to drive this home. 50% of kids have a chronic disease. 74% of Americans are overweight or obese. 50% of children are overweight or obese. 120 years ago, there was no such thing as obesity. It was so rare. Every case was written in, in medical journals or actually the circus. <laughs> this sounds horrible, but they would put obese people in the circus as a novelty because it was so rare. No one ever saw that before. 77% <clears throat> of young adults are not fit to serve in the military. 50 to 60% of adults have prediabetes or diabetes, which that increases your risk of cancer, heart attack, stroke, and Alzheimer's and about everything else. 33% of young people have prediabetes or diabetes. 1950, a pediatrician goes entire career with not seeing a type 2 diabetic in a kid. Now 33% of Americans or kids are there. Um, we've got 30%, or excuse me, 18% of teens have fatty liver disease. This used to be only in end stage alcoholic liver cirrhosis. Um, young adult cancers are up 79%. For the first time ever, we're going to have 2 million cases of newly diagnosed cancer in a year. 25% of American women are on antidepressants. 40% of 18-year-olds have a mental health diagnosis. 26% of women have polycystic ovarian disease. Fertility rates are declining as our sperm counts 1% per year since the 1970s. Nine out of 10. The top 10 leading causes of death of Americans are directly related to food. Yet medical schools don't teach anything about food. 80% of medical schools have zero nutrition classes. I got two hours of nutrition in four years of my medical school education. So if the leading killers are directly related to food and doctors get no food education, is it any wonder we're so sick and getting sicker and dying younger? We opted to go the medication route. We're trying to medicate our way out of something we ate ourselves into. No one's talking about the food, at least in the doctor's office. The doctor doesn't have time to talk about food. Number one, he doesn't have the knowledge. Number two, he doesn't have the time. And number three, there's no incentive to. The prescription pad is the only tool in the toolbox of an American doctor. That's a big problem and it needs to change. Unfortunately, this is not going to change because it's funded by the prescription pad company, <laughs> by the pharmaceutical industry. So you've got to take it upon yourself to learn the truth and then walk in that truth. Unfortunately, the doctors aren't going to learn it unless they do it outside the U.S. medical school education system, in my opinion. Okay, one of the things they learn in the United States medical school system is pharma math. This is the reason we keep doing the same thing over and over and over and expecting a different outcome, but we're not getting a different outcome. That's a definition of insanity, but we continue to push the pharmaceutical prescription answer, yet it's not working, hasn't worked, never will work, actually. Well, why do doctors keep doing it? In my opinion, it's because of pharma math. So what do I mean by that? Let's go to the whiteboard and I'll show you what pharma math is. All right, everybody, so pharma math. Let's go to the whiteboard here. There was a trial back in the day called the ASCOT trial. This is a very popular cholesterol lowering drug. So what does this drug do as far as preventing heart attacks, fatal and non-fatal heart attacks is what the ASCOT trial was looking at. What they found in the cholesterol lowering drug group, a 1.9% of those people had a heart attack. In the placebo group, 3% of those people had a heart attack. So real world math would be three minus 1.9 equals 1.1%. So that's what a doctor should tell you. If you take this drug for this long, according to this trial, you'll have a 1.1% reduction in your chance of a heart attack. That makes common sense, right? Well, that's not a very good number. That wouldn't be very popular, actually. Probably not many people would sign up for that. So what do they do? And by the way, that's called absolute risk reduction. That's a word you should learn. That's a word you should be using in your doctor's office visits. Hey, doc, this pharmaceutical you're giving me, what's the absolute risk reduction there? That is what simple math is. Pharma math does what is called divide and subtract. 
I think there's another term in the marketing world about look over here, not over here, something like that. <laughs> Divide and subtract relative risk reduction. This is what they're going to quote. This is what you'll see in the magazine articles, social media, the TV commercials. And this is what your doctor sees on a big, fancy, shiny pie chart that the drug rep brings into his office. So what do they do? They take the 3% from the placebo group, placebo group divide it by the 1.9% from the treatment group. So division here, 0.64 is the number you get. Then they subtract that from one and that gets you 0.36, move the decimal, 36% relative risk reduction. Well, what does that tell you? That tells you nothing except it looks a lot better on the marketing material like in this magazine article that a uh, famous cardiovascular surgeon promoted this particular drug. 36% reduction in heart attack was the big bold letters. But look at the little asterisk on there. Go down to the fine print and you'll see that it shows in a trial, placebo group had 2%, uh, the treatment group had a 3%, and they, they tell you in the small print. And guys, it's not just this drug. In this book, Statin Zasser, David Brownstein, page 126, he goes through not only the ASCOT trial, but the top 20 statin trials. And he puts absolute risk reduction in this column here, so you can go read this for yourself. And I'll just tell you, it's anywhere from an increased risk of heart attack on some of these trials, 0.3% absolute risk increase, versus a 0.9% absolute risk decrease but you average all the trials together on these medications, you're getting about a 0.8% absolute risk reduction. That's nothing, guys. This is why we continue to do the same thing over and over and over because the doctors think and the general public thinks they're getting real benefit at 36%. I found a study just the other day on osteoporosis to really drive this home. And actually this study was about doctors communicating absolute risk versus relative risk reduction of osteoporotic drugs called bisphosphonates like Fosamax and Boniva and others. And this is an actual study, it, the title of the study, Communicating Absolute Fracture Risk Reduction in the Acceptance of Treatment for Osteoporosis. So what this publication and what this study did was ask the patient, are you more willing to accept this treatment if we use absolute risk reduction number to you or not? And here's what it showed. I'm going to quote from the article. For example, in the context of osteoporosis, many bisphosphonates reduce the relative risk of hip fractures by 40% compared with the placebo. Although this sounds impressive, the absolute risk reduction in terms of hip fractures prevented in osteoporotic women in this particular paper, 12 fractures per 1,000 women in the placebo group, 8 fractures per 1,000 women in the treatment group. That's a difference of 4 people out of 1,000, which equals 0.04%. Oh, excuse me, 0 .4%. The absolute risk reduction of taking this drug is 0.4%. The marketing term, relative risk reduction, is 40%. So can you imagine the outcome of the study? When they asked the patient, would you like to take this drug that reduces your hip fracture rate by 40%? Or would you like to take this drug that reduces your hip fracture rate by 0.4%? How many said yes to this one? And how many said yes to this one? <laughs> well, it probably wouldn't shock you to realize the conclusion of the study is more patients will be likely to agree to the medication if you use relative risk reduction numbers. Surprising. Guys, if, it's hard not to laugh at this, but it's real. This is absolutely the way things are communicated. Flu shots. I looked up flu shots real quick. You want to know what the absolute risk reduction? If you take a flu shot, <clears throat> and this was from Cochrane Database, they looked at 52 clinical trials, including 80,000 people. This covered the years uh, back into the 1950s even. Here's what they found. For the people that took a flu shot, healthy adults, 0.9% would get the flu. For people that didn't take a flu shot, 2.3% would get the flu. So that's a 1.4% difference in your risk of getting the flu if you took it or didn't take it. Further in the study, 
risk of hospitalization in those that took a flu shot was 14.1%. Risk of hospitalization from flu if you didn't take the flu shot was 14.7%. So that's a 0.6 reduction in hospitalization risk from this shot. And a little side note on that, there's multiple other studies. This is not a flu shot uh, talk today. But there are many studies that show when you decrease your risk of flu by 1%, but that same shot increases your risk of contracting other respiratory viruses, the other flu-like viruses, the chances of that goes up, including coronavirus, increased risk of coronavirus 36%. So we're going to reduce 1% on the flu and increase your risk of other viruses. Guys, the point of all this is your body's designed perfectly. If you will steward it and give it what it needs, there's no deficiency of Nexium causing your reflux. There's no deficiency of Ozempic causing your diabetes and obesity. There's no deficiency of aspirin causing your headache. There's no deficiency of Lipitor causing high cholesterol and heart attacks. All of this was a big guess, a big theory, and it was wrong. The things we're doing to try to fix disease isn't fixing anything, and doctors will tell you that we're managing asthma, managing hypertension, managing diabetes. We're not fixing anything because fix is related to food, and doctors don't know about food. We're not taught that. And this management of disease produces the worst outcomes. We die younger and sicker and spend the most money doing it. And then we do this kind of math, pharma math, to get you convinced to sign up for that to get you excited about signing up for that, to get you clamoring for that. Oh, I gotta have this good job that has good health insurance, it'll pay for this. It's all deception, smoke and mirrors. You need the truth, the truth will set you free. You were designed to be well, all you gotta do is gain the knowledge and walk it out, trust the design. Your body needs cholesterol, that's a whole nother talk, but your brain, your immune system and every cell of your body needs cholesterol. You want hormones to come up, thyroid, testosterone, you need cholesterol. God did not design you so poorly that you'd make something every single day that would kill you. Eat real food. Move around. Get some sun. Hydrate well. Mineral rich, clean water. And most of all, be at peace. All this fear mongering and run into the spirit of pharmacia to deal with the spirit of fear doesn't work. <laughs> Let the spirit of truth set you free. We'll see you next time.